media calls Game Chains a drama. It deals with contemporary American presidential politics and the rise and fall of Sarah Palin. All I can say is HBO showed brilliance in choosing a director who knows how to handle farts. <laughs> Jay's most recent film, The Campaign, continues in this vein of trenchant political observation while making room for the comic brilliance of Will Farrell, Zach Galifianakis, and Jason Sudeikis. Indeed, his work creating the Austin Powers series and the Meet the Parents series Jay has had enormous success directing comedy. Directing comedy. That's a conundrum wrapped in an enigma. Nobody knows what exactly directors do. Nobody is sure how comedy gets funny. When comedy works, it looks effortless. Sometimes great comedy actually looks accidental or even spontaneous, made up on the spot by funny people who, possessed by a silly demon, do outrageous things having no idea why they do what they do. That may be how it looks, but nothing could be farther from the truth. Comedy that looks random is highly intentional. Comedy that breaks rules is bounded by rules. Far from being frivolous, most comedy artists are quite serious people. Like Jay, who was an economics major at Stanford. He wasn't born doing comedy. Tonight we have an extraordinary opportunity to hear how some of the loosest looking, most seemingly freewheeling comedy sequences Jay has created came about. We may also have the chance to ask him how he learned to direct comedy and how to work with brilliant comic actors like Mike Myers, Ben Stiller, Robert De Niro, Dustin Hoffman, Barbara Streisand, Owen Wilson, Farrell, and Galifianakis. Please join me in welcoming Jay Rook. Sitting down and having to sit here and <laughs> while he well he said such nice things, so uh, I'm not used to that. So uh, that's a, that's an awkward start, but I really appreciate. it. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so uh, you know, I, I I want this to be a as interactive as it possibly can can be. And um, uh, how many of you how how you guys had have you had these before? Have you had people come and talk to you guys for? Uh, about um, comedy already? You are officially the second. Who was the first? The first was Bruce Block, who's one of our Oh, nice. You know yeah. Bruce? Oh, yeah, he's, I he's great, right? learned most of what I know about filming. Today. There you go. Of course, Block. you're a student here. Exactly. And Bruce, as you know, has produced and designed many comedies. Comedies, and he yeah. talked to us about, about the camera in comedy. Great. Well, actually, I'll refer to... I was going to refer to Bruce Block and a couple of design elements. See, guys, this is all planned out. Yep. It all works <laughs> together. It's seamless. I, th I was afraid you were going to say Judd Apatow, who's freaking hilarious, actually hilarious, even as a stand-up, and he is an impossible act to follow, and I've had to do that many times. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I was, the reason I was asking is just what format you're used to. Um, one thing I thought I would do is just make a couple of generic remarks first and then show you a clip or two from from comedies I've worked on, and mostly because, not because I love seeing them again or showing them again, uh, although I must admit, I don't usually watch them, but today I was like, oh, that's actually pretty funny. Because um, <laughs> um, I, 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 one of the things that I wanted to share with you is that um, what makes doing comedy so hard is not, not knowing, never knowing what's really funny. You, you have an instinct, you, there's a certain hunch that it's gonna be funny, but you never ever know for sure and it's one of the most stressful parts about making films. And one of the reasons I don't go back and watch my films is that there's so much pain <laughs> involved with making them that I mostly just feel the pain as I watch the jokes. <laughs> and today, for somehow, for some reason, I was watching through your eyes in a way, uh, uh, anticipating watching through your eyes, um, and and sort of remembering what I liked about some of the scenes, so it was actually really. I'm going to sit over here so you can yeah, look sure. at me every now and then. Just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so um, that's you know that's what part of what I'm going to talk about is what makes it so hard, what makes it so easy. I, I'm doing less and less comedy. I'm going to keep doing them because they're fun, but. They are so much harder than uh, than doing straight films. So if you can do dramas, maybe just stick to that because um, it's it's hard to do comedy. However, it's incredibly rewarding, and if you get good at it and you sit in an audience, 
watching people actually lose their minds, there's nothing better. It's actually addictive, and it's why most of us who do comedy are completely screwed up. We're completely mm -hmm. dysfunctional, neurotic people because we get addicted to pleasing the audience. And once you're hooked on that, you, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a sickness. <laughs> and it's an enjoyable one, but you, it's so great. It's such a drug when you're, I, I, was, in, I was telling Barnett, or actually at a lunch recently, I, uh, I can talk about this film because I didn't direct it, I just produced it, but I produced Borat and I worked on Borat for years before we actually got to make it, uh, working on the story and I was deeply involved in doing it, so I'm proud of it, but, I, but Larry Charles directed it and Sasha uh, Baron Cohen had a lot. Have you guys, how many of you seen Borat? Okay, so. Oh, just a couple. <laughs> um, when, when, um, when Borat, you know, has a crush on Pamela Anderson and then He's really, he can't get back to her, and he's very distraught about it, and he discovers his producing partner, Azamat, masturbating to a picture of her. They proceed to have a fight, and it's a naked fight. They're fighting without their clothes on. I do remember that sequence. <laughs> yeah. uh, that sequence has the most explosive and most extended build I've ever seen in any of my experiences with comedies. And I've been involved with a lot of comedies, not just the ones I'm making. I, I watch cuts of all of us in the comedy world, at least in LA, tend to help each other, watch each other, you know, Judd, um, uh, a lot of the guys that we work with, Ben, ben Stiller, uh, Judd Apatow, um, uh, Adam McKay, a lot of the people that I, we all watch. And I've seen, I've been to the previews of many, I've never seen anything like the naked fight in Borat, and we showed it all over the world, and it happened, this experience occurred every time where I would look down the aisles, because I just, I'd seen so many times, I would just, just study the crowds, and we actually started filming them with um, infrared cameras to maybe use as commercials, and so it was, it was like an anthropological experiment, only <laughs> it just looked like insane people or people who were speaking <laughs> in tongues or because people would grab their shirts and pull them over their heads they would start slapping you know, ah! <laughs> people would run down the aisles in one screening of two guys ran down the aisles ran in front of the screen and then ran back high-fiving the audience and it was, <laughs> this is at a mall this is a mall theater and there is just nothing there's nothing you know more exciting than that so if you can if you have endurance and you don't mind the, the terror of, of the process and, and that, that horrible feeling when you're sitting there directing a scene and you're going, oh, this is not only not funny, this is the worst crap I've ever seen, you know, and, which is a daily experience while you're making comedies because you, who can keep finding it funny take after take? Who can keep, you know, remembering why you're even doing something so silly once it's lost its comedic potential, it's so painful, but when you get in that theater and see that kind of experience. So, um, and I've had a few, I've never directed anything that came cl that close to that, that kind of response, but when we're doing comedies, you may have heard this technique, and you stop me if you guys actually already do this, but we, when we preview, we record the sound of the audience and then lay it back uh, onto the avid for every single preview we do, and then we listen to the. Do you guys already? How many of you do that already? Do you ever no, try that? We don't do that. Do I you ever get? I never even. That's nuts. Yeah, it is nuts, <laughs> and I'll tell you why. It's also awesome. Um, do you? How many of you guys uh, may, have made a comedy film already? Okay, so you've already, and uh, uh, and how many are, are have written a comedy script? Cool. And is, are those the same people? Or is, have you written? How many of you written a comedy script just that you did not make, but you just wrote it yourself? You know, to either sell or use. Okay, or someone else shot. Okay, that's great. So, uh, what happens when you start uh, doing it professionally, and when you're when people are trying to measure its future in the commercial market? Is you start testing, and they do it in television too. I think they must do it different. I've never been involved in. Needle testing is the worst, most painful thing. People with no eyes. Testing. Oh, wow. The worst thing in the world. And I would, I would shoot myself. I would shoot just myself. shoot myself while I was watching. You never want to know that. Because I've seen them use, I've been involved in the political version of that, that uh, Frank Luntz version, you know, the you sitting there and listen to a speech, and it's so, it doesn't, it's, yeah, yeah, I would be, I would not survive that, I don't think. But in previews, you actually get to hear laughter, and um, what you find when you start 
showing cuts, you know, you're usually showing a two hour and 15 minute cut of something or two hour and 30 minute, you're gonna cut an hour out of it. So you start listening to what's working and what's not and you don't know, you sort of know, but you sort of don't know what it, what it is that really needs to stay in. So you let the audience interact. You don't let the audience own, you don't let the audience control you, but you, you'd be a fool, I think, not in comedy, since it's an interactive experience, uh, not to workshop it a little bit and find out what is the experience because it's such a it's so different from drama which I don't test my I didn't test my dramas like that the two dramas I did for HBO but in comedy you you, you really need to do it anyway so um, it you you start to really think about the science of where the laugh is what's the timing why did that work this screening and not the screening before somehow we cut out something that mattered last time where where was that and you start being able to take those those uh, stored up laugh tracks, we call them, and and watch the film exactly how it looks, you know, on the app. But instead of the soundtrack, you have the the track that you ran, you know, with the matching version on, on that screening, and you you become uh, you know somewhat more expert in what works and what doesn't, and it it's it's like a scientific pseudo scientific thing that that gets you and I'm gonna point out a couple of things I was watching today a couple of these scenes I was like why is that so long what why didn't we cut that out there's a dead moment right there I can't believe I'm watching a, a thing that's gone out millions of copies and there's this horrible dead spot and then I go oh yeah I forgot because there's a laugh there and when we heard it and it was stepping on the lines after that when you're not alone when you're in a crowd we had opened it up and, and saved the next lap because the next lap was getting killed because you were losing some key information yeah. under the loud laugh that was in the previous thing. Anyway, so it just, I, I, part of what I'm gonna talk about is uh, how obsessive you get and how Sasha, who's a friend, uh, uh, has taken it even further and actually kind of does a really cool thing where you really, and Mike did it too, the, the comedians do it even more than the directors, I think, because you really wanna, you become, you use the science to give yourself certainty when there is no, no certainty and the specificity, even rounding it to decimal points that, that are a hilarious kind of numerical equivalent of how big was that laugh? Well, it's when you ask. Mike, you know, is this Mike Myers? Well, all of us do it, but uh, so Actually I don't want, call um, numbers on them? We put numbers on them. And, if, and sometimes we'll debate some, and you get, it gets very heated because it's a collaborative thing. If, if, if you, I don't know how many of you guys do comedy alone, that's, hard and we uh, most of the people I know do comedy as a group because you there's a director who has to decide and there are stars who end up being involved in the decisions but you have to decide and you have to fight out in sweaty rooms with bad takeout food laying around all over the place what is going to be the movie you know and you end up saying well what's the score on that laugh at that <laughs> moment in preview two uh, and did it work in preview 2B, which is the preview you ran simultaneously the same night with a different cut because you were testing just that joke. Wow. And it's, that's what I'm talking about. It's neurotic. It's, it's insane. So um, that you become, you, you tell yourself there's a science, and that's, that's what I hope we can talk a little bit about tonight once, you, uh, once we do some of this stuff. So, okay, let me show some stuff and stop talking. Um, I want to give you a choice, um, and we'll just do majority rules uh, democracy right now. Um, I have looked at two films and, and two, some hunks of stuff and um, how many of you have seen Meet the Parents? It helps if you've already seen Okay, that's cool. Wow. I didn't get that percentage from my... Uh, how many of you have seen my film straight? <laughs> <laughs> hey! All right. See me afterwards. <laughs> that is the... That's that's awesome. Was that, that was drama, right? Huh? Was that drama or comedy? No, it's a comedy. It's a romantic <laughs> Yeah, um, it, it's, uh, I haven't seen it. That's okay, I'm sorry. obviously you're good company. Uh, so, um, how many people have seen Aust uh, Austin Powers 2? Okay, wow, this is awesome. I seriously wonder when they tell me what the profit, we're still in the red on uh, Austin 1. And, uh, so wait, how many have seen Austin Powers 1? Yeah, see, that's like everybody. We're, oh, yeah. What's the deal with that accounting? I can't figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the only time I ever get to measure what the. the well, go for gold member. How many for gold member? <laughs> yeah, slightly fewer than that. Um, so here's the choice. I, there's a scene in um, Meet the Parents. Um, uh, let's see, there's two. I was going to show the dinner scene because I'll just tell you since you know the film, you don't. The dinner scene 
is an eight minute long scene, which is extremely long for any comedy. And it's just talking. There's no action. There's a little tiny bit of action at the very end. Um, and what's remarkable about it is that it's at the end of a 30 minute first act and it's the only huge laugh in 30 solid minutes. There's all, a little bit of laughter along the way. Are you a pothead fucker? And uh, I don't know, there's a, a little moments, you know, all the way through. I, you know, what are you doing? Oh, I'm reading. He, he, Ben's watching De Niro at the drugstore. He comes back, catches him watching. He goes, what are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just catching up on the magazines. I'm reading all about breast pumps. And he shows the breast pumps. And these are all little laughs all the way through. And there is, at the end of in all, every preview and every crowd we saw, an explosive thing that happens at the end of that dinner scene that's carefully built. But it's, it's a lot of little pieces, which I, I could show you, but it's a little less... Um, it's a little less, uh, what's the right word? It's, it's not so much physical comedy. There's another, and, I could, and I'll tell you, I could point out some of the very tricky, I don't know what you would call it, just uh, sort of careful building and of the mosaic that took the setup, that final joke that really launched that movie. That joke became the, the kind of word of mouth experience that and I fought to keep it out of the trailers it wasn't allowed in any of the trailers and I, I laid on the tracks for that I almost didn't wow I almost got fired I mean, that was about. They always want to put the big they have very big jokes that's a trailer moment you know as big as it can get and I knew it would wreck the play quote-unquote playability and that they were fooling themselves that the uh, that the marketing would it actually would reduce the word of mouth and word of, I think word of mouth is huge so uh, and then the other one was this long build-up to um, to uh, Owen oh, Wilson, um, uh, well, when, when Greg Parker uh, sets the chuppah on fire, I don't know, if, and that's one of my favorite sequences, and it's very physical, and I could show you the build-up to that, and then, um, uh, the, then it's those two scenes, and we each have, I can each talk a lot about how we did them, and they were, they were very hard, and very, very, uh, very, very, um, sorry, we're just worked, and then the other one would be uh, the opening of Austin Powers 2, which is the um, which is this title sequence with him in some nudity blocking, very choreographed Busby Berkeley thing, and one of the most expensive openings, only topped by Austin Three, which is even more expensive, probably in comedy history. Um, and uh, what was the other one? I lost my. Uh, sheet that I have. Oh, perfect. Thanks. Oh well. Um, Stan has a copy of it upstairs, but I don't know what I did with my other copy. Thank you, sheet. Uh, Anyway, um, the uh, the other one was um, what's the other physical thing? Oh, uh, the uh, tent sequence in uh, the t the tent shadow sequence in Austin Powers, which was the most overworked and rehearsed thing I've ever done. So, which who, how many would rather see a Meet the Parents sequence? And I'll say some first one is vote for Meet the Parents, and then we'll vote for Austin Powers. Meet the Parents, okay. Austin Powers. Man. <laughs> All right, I'll try to get through the book. Okay, so we'll go with Meet the Parents first, because it is my favorite comedy that I've ever done. Like, personal for me, and it's completely character-based, and it had, uh, it's an example of having a controlling idea that never failed me throughout the entire process, and every single decision I made came out of a few controlling ideas that, uh, that you share with you, us? I'll share with you. Right. So let's, um, let's see. Uh, that yeah. I just saw it. Okay. Um, let's see. So, so could you go, Stan, from? Um, yeah, let's just just run the dinner sequence. I won't give all the setup. So, uh, there's a number of things. I mean, I won't show all the setup, but I'll tell you a few things that we set up. If just to remind you, uh, Greg Fokker likes dogs more than cats. Greg Fokker is trying to quit smoking. Uh, Jack. Jack Burns is a grandfatherly looking guy, but something deadly is going on under the surface. He has soft sweaters and a cat and a waspy wife, and he seems like a deadly guy. Um, Greg Fokker has tried to uh, uh, propose to his girlfriend, finds out that his, his girlfriend's sister has already been a, uh, proposed to and needed the permission of Jack Burns, uh, De Niro's character, and so the controlling idea of the whole movie is uh, he wants more than anything else to win the approval of the father-in-law. And the problem is that he is so uh, 
self-loathing that he thinks he he either senses or knows, he mostly senses that he's out of his league with this girl and doesn't he'll, he'll never live up to what she expects and he'll definitely never live up to what the, the, uh, the father-in-law expects. And by wanting it that bad, he will hide all his faults, like smoking and, and uh, sneakiness, and, and he will sneak and make things worse, and he will try to be funny, he'll bring gifts, but he will lie a lot. And he will sneak a lot and do deceptive things a lot. And what he doesn't know yet is, and he finds out through the story, is that he is in, he has come up against a human lie detector, a bullshit detector, who's actually a mole hunter for the CIA. So those two things, a liar meets a bullshit detector, was the entire n anxiety dream. And I always called it an anxiety dream. It's, it's to me, it's Annie Hall meets Eraserhead. How many of you have seen Eraserhead, uh, David Lynch? <laughs> It's the scariest, weirdest, funniest, most sick film ever of, about a, a guy's fear of fatherhood. But that, that thing of trying to get in a person's head who's so dysfunctional and neurotic that they will make their lives worse at, at every step. So um, let's just run, what else do you need to know about? Um, oh, and, and so De Niro is um, so kind of nerdy that he's taught the cat to uh, use the toilet. And he, as a result, he's trying to teach him the cat pees in all the potted plants all over the house and he's just is a is a slightly tortured cat who knows a lot of tricks all right so let's roll the dinner scene just the head of the dinner scene stand i don't know that's not the place that i originally marked for you but i did have a, a time for it do you happen to fourteen? yeah i think yep. that's right okay uh one one hour 14 yep no it would be at um okay, well, let me just pull up my computer and i because i can't find my list <laughs> thank you <laughs> In comedy, people repeat their mistakes over so and over. those of you in my class, did you see him run down the facts that pertain to the scene? The facts, right? Circumstances, facts. Predicament, you know, uh, suspense. This, this film is, depends on suspense. So um, to create suspense, you have to wire multiple engines that are all uh, going to generate suspense as they go. And, um, engines, motors, taking, yeah. keeping the motor alive. Okay, so it's um, <laughs> it's um, zero zero twenty four. Okay. Uh, twenty four minutes in. All right. Thank you. Do you watch the in laws a lot when you're working yeah, on stuff? Yeah, good. While well, while well, he's looking for it, uh, it, the the uh, influences the influences were uh, the in laws partly very you know actually quite a bit because there were, you had a CIA guy and we had dinner scenes. You had and the dinner scene and you have him speaking Chinese, and, you know, yeah, Asian, neurotic right. Jewish guy, and yeah, there's a lot of, um, but the. One of the great influences was a film that David O. Russell did called Flirting with Disaster. How many of you have seen that? It's an awesome film. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's how I decided Ben Stiller should do the movie. Uh, something about Mary, which I was going to show some of, was a big influence on us. Um, uh, but, um, but yeah, really, I really tried to, you'll see in the timing as you think about Eraserhead, which is a weird, uh, the, there are scenes in Eraserhead where he'll walk up and push an elevator button and stand there, and stand there. You're going, cut, cut, and just stay. It just goes forever. And that, that using filmic language to unravel your brain, that's what, th I, there are lots of places in our film where I try to, try to stay on things. OK. Um, let's see. OK, good. Thank you. Some other setup things, he lost his bag, so he's, those clothes are not his normal clothes, you know, so he's really uncomfortable. He borrowed those clothes. Uh, um, what's the other, there was another big thing that I remembered, but I forgot to, anyway, you could, there were so many details that um, were, that were woven in for 30 minutes to, to pay, to pay that off, and um, yeah, so, at, and at that time, because, you know, there weren't the sequels and nobody knew what, what was going on, it was, a, it was, it was very effective. Um, any questions about anything you saw before I, uh, anybody have? Any questions about any of that? Yeah. How long did you guys rehearse that? Um, that's a good. That's a good one. We rehearsed it um, just a couple times through. And the great thing about dinner scenes, which I've now done a lot of, and table scenes because of the Doctor Evil table and because of the Fockers thing, and now we did a funny table scene in a in um, the campaign with Zach and his kids. It's a it's a whole it's a whole thing, and I I realize now I look forward to them because. 
it's one of the few times you don't have to make blocking decisions except where that where they're going to sit, which is actually a huge thing. Huge. Um, but they uh, and and there's a very specific one here. Um, but once I got them down to once I figured out where they were going to sit, I just had them read through it a few times. The the that the day that I shot that I almost made a fatal error and it would have ruined that scene and it was I had already lost it was only my third film and the first by the end of the second day I was a day and a half behind I took two days to shoot half a day's work and by the time in, and the studio was really freaking out and I almost made a decision when we shot this that would have elongated the shoot so much I might have been shut down and there was a lady on the set who was constantly threatening to fire my alarm producer and, and shut us down and it was I almost had Greg and Pam sitting across from each other. It sounds so minor, but if I had gotten into, uh, if you guys have designed coverage in a dinner table situation where everyone's looking every which way, so you not only have the two angles across each other and like this, you also have everybody's look to everybody else that really kind of needs to be covered because comedy loves two eyes and loves to feel you know, the emotion in, in faces, not, it doesn't love that kind of cool Steven Soderbergh side, pro, which I, ripped off in my dramas, where you get to use side angles and profile, you've got to get in people's faces. By putting them side by side, which is a completely forced, ridiculous way to sit if you're at a dinner table, I was able to get through, I shot it in three days. It's, it looks like it should be shot in one day, but it was a three day shoot so that I could have, Ben still have many chances to improvise. And even, and De Niro also, Ben, ben and Bob, were improvising a lot, especially Ben. Ben made up the whole thing about Geppetto and the little <laughs> cat thing, and uh, the two, uh, and so much information, which always got that line always cracks me up because it's a complete throwaway line. Uh, it was very moving and also very a lot of information. Um, and uh, you know, so you want you want time in comedy to play because, and so we. I, in that sort of a situation, I shoot the rehearsals. I, I let them read through it a couple times, sometimes maybe once, and then I say, okay, keep reading through it, but now I'm going to be filming, so final touch is everybody go and make these guys look like they're ready for photography. Table scenes being a little bit different in terms Table of scenes rehearsal are, because you're going to do it so many times. Yeah, they're exactly. going to have to repeat it with every single angle so yeah. many times. So many times, which, another big tip uh, for your future, don't let your actors eat very much in comedy scenes. If they start eating... They will be eating the same thing every take for three straight days, no matter whether it's lunch or dinner. They will be eating all day, and they get sick. They actually eventually have to have a bucket that they... Elizabeth Hurley in uh, Austin Powers had to bite a sausage that was perfectly lined up with Mike Myers' anatomy 25 times. She had to bite the end off the sausage. And she was like, I love bangers, you know? I'm, a, I'm an English girl. And she got so sick and just had to start having a bucket to spit the... So Ben still is eating those green beans because the, he knows, he knows don't bite into the chicken because if you start eating chicken, you're dead. Except for the rule that says eating is funny. Eating is funny if you can, if you can make the business work, and, but you have to work it out with the actors to, to say, okay, I'm only going to be in that close-up. And, and once you, if you decide to eat a lot, I'm going to tell you which take and which shot I'm going to use, and then you can't do it anymore in any of the wider shots. Uh, anyway, so that, that right. the rehearsal thing is a big a big question because you you you're always on have the dilemma of if I re over rehearse it I might lose the spontaneity before I start shooting but if I under rehearse it I might waste a lot of film. Digital for me solved that. I don't worry about it anymore. <laughs> I just shoot. I start shooting r almost right away and multiple cameras. This film was shot with two cameras uh, all the time in that scene, which was a debate with the DP because DPs don't like to light for two angles. The light looks best from one angle and. And comedy, especially now, it's gotten even more so. It's much, much more common to do multiple cameras. And uh, I had to, I had a very carefully mapped out. Uh, I use overhead diagrams, just you know, circles with little noses on them to show where which direction. And I I uh, stage the scenes based on those. But then I try to storyboard them if I have time. And I brought some of my storyboards, which I'll show you that apply more to the uh, the physical scenes. Any other uh, any other questions about how that works? Um, do you have a lot of breaking? Because they improvise. Or yes. Like yeah. They uh, when a Ben starts what did you ask? Breaking. losing, you know, oh, uh, breaking. Break, laughing in the middle and breaking a take. You mean? Is that what yeah. you mean? Not breaking dishes or something. No, no, no. <laughs> um, yeah. They 
that's a problem. There's a scene I'm going to show you with Owen Wilson and De Niro, which I had to stop shooting that day. I couldn't get them to stop laughing <laughs> to shoot. I'm serious. It was a it was a a plague, you know, at that moment. It was, and I was I was laughing so hard that I couldn't think, and I said, okay, that's it. Let's come back to this tomorrow. Uh, and uh, that's really hard because you want to keep going, and sometimes the takes after they've broken, as you call it, are the best takes because the when I was working with Dustin Hoffman and Barbara Streisand. If they started laughing and making it, their next few takes were by far the best takes because they were, they were, they knew they were in each other's funny zone and they they were doing it for each other from then on. And it, oh, it got so good when they when they started doing that. Other questions? How much of the shot rehearsals do you have at least? Do you ever have to go back and pull those those takes that you that you shot? Oh, a lot, a lot because but you know, um, I don't. I so far ha have not found a way either with the way we come at the scripts or the way we cast or whatever to do a kind of Woody Allen style, his, the later Woody Allen style w one shot comedy scene where you don't, you just don't cover it or cut. And so the, the scenes are cut up a lot. I mean, there are, and there are pieces from 10 takes or more sometimes from, from, from every piece, you know, and, and it's the, it's the best one. And it's, there's no rule. You some actors they always say some actors are great right at the beginning and some actors are great at take 25, and I don't find I don't find that to be re useful. I find the spontaneity can be amazing, but then so can the um, familiarity with the rhythms once they get into a rhythm, and uh, a lot of times the rehearsals are so funky because the rhythm is so off, because they don't know what's going on that it feels the least scripted and the least stilted. And other times, they haven't learned it yet, and uh, unfortunately a lot of times the, in, in this film, uh, some of the actors weren't bent on learning lines, I won't say who, but they, I had to cover it so much uh, because I, and there was never a flow in the scene. There was a flow when they read it off the page, but I was suicidal uh, when we were shooting this. I was just like, this, is not, this isn't working at all. And it's not until you pull those takes, and sometimes it's the very first one. And then you can you make it editorially, even though you couldn't get the rhythm. Because uh, it's an eight-page scene. I really actually was unrealistic to expect them to know every... And especially once people started improvising, then the, the memorized responses go out the window. So then you really are stuck in little tiny pieces. And that's why it takes three days to shoot an eight-minute scene. I mean, is there a certain point when you said green light for improvisation, or they do I, they feel free all the you time? You know, um, there's uh, with Ben. I think everybody assumes you're going to get amazing stuff if you stick in it. He's a he's an incredibly disciplined actor. knows every line. knows knows other people's lines. He could do the whole scene, um, but he uh, but he is such a brilliant improviser that you pretty much the very first day we shot was. Um, when Ben Stiller gets out of the car in front of their house and they come up and do this crazy awkward hug thing and it was said they all hug awkwardly but almost all of the banter at that moment would, and that was the first day of the shoot that's when I dropped a day <laughs> behind because I didn't I didn't build that in and I just didn't know how good he was going to be so then I started working out this sent the coverage to make sure it was simple enough that we didn't spend all the time lighting and moving cameras we spent all the time take you know doing takes and that's that's a huge rule. Uh, that's a great thing to figure out is that if you're trying to make a stand for yourself in a, in a certain way by, by letting the style of the movie take all day, you know, let the DP tweak everything, come up with the killer shots, and you'll get some great looking shots, but you might not get the comedic performances you want because your day gets, it's not the, what did Lauren Michaels used to say? It's not the takes that take the time, it's the time between the takes that take the time. And if you're, if you're, you know, if you're marching through all this elaborate setup and not getting takes, then you don't get that kind of performance. And every one of those people, Terry Polo's looks on her face when he's milking the cat, or <laughs> Blythe Danner, that giant close-up of Blythe. I mean, those looks are, be and they were doing those all day long for, you know, for three straight, straight days, and some of them are, some of the best ones are at the end. Um, what else? Anything else? Yeah. When you're shooting with multiple cameras, are you shooting opposing angles? Or are you shooting like good question. Same, like, very, very, very good question. And big decision. 
Does everybody know what that? She said, "Did you hear that? She are you shooting uh, directly? Do you have two cameras running opposite each other, like they do on tell, like sixty minutes or something, where you're getting the question and the response, or do you, or am I shooting parallel, straight in? In this film, I shot only parallel, straight in, uh, which meant I had to match the action when I turned around, and and there were, there were, I shot most of it from Blythe's end of the table towards." Bob, uh, you know, then there's the end from Bob's end towards, towards them, and then straight in on, on Terry and Ben. But then I shot Terry and Ben from both directions too. And then I shot, um, I jumped over Blythe and Bob to shoot between them to make sure Bob's look to Ben was a tight eye line. Tight eye line is something I like, you know, when the, the, I just think comedy plays really well when the person's looking near the camera. So, I would go two, 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 and I just kind of worked around the table with, again, with a kind of careful map. And then I don't like to shoot the same uh, size image for very long. I uh, march in almost, almost every take. Maybe I shoot a couple. If, I don't, if it's not, if it really fell apart, I'll get it again to make sure I have that size so that there's variety of image size and angle. So I'm always trying to take advantage of the lighting. Since I'm not going to do a lot of cool style, I'll get editorial variety because I do think comedy comes together in the editing, so I give myself a ton of, ton of, ton of choices. So in those two shots, in those two angles, there, each camera might be getting three or four sizes. And then I'll also do, you know, I also had to do a big wide shots to get that geography and also shots from the, from the urn's point of view and over Bob to the urn. So I'm sure there's, I'm sure we shot you know, if you counted um, setups. setups, you know, every day, I probably shot 40 or 50 setups, yeah. Yeah, but sure. just by mostly cheating in the, in the counting those setups times three days. So 150 setups for, uh, you know, so the, the script supervisor's line down the page for every, where there's one line for every setup. So just to put that camera thing in, in history and historical context, used to be the DPs didn't want to run two cameras at all because it would compromise their lighting, yeah. compromise the position of the the primary camera, and they started cooperating a little bit, a little yeah. bit about and now, putting two on the same axis. But now, in comedy, now the evolution has come. Film comedy is now coming almost all the way around to do scissor, sitcom scissor comedy, comedy, yeah. which is so. Barnett and I are facing each other, just face me, and We're and now uh, you know I would have normally done the over and the single in the same setup. Usually, the single tighter eye line than the over, but. Um, it's right kind of tricky mapping that up. Over his yeah. at the same and time. but multiple sizes. I'm doing. I'm doing this size because comedy likes that, and I love it when it's got holes two or three people. I love those shots that are over Blythe to see t Terry and and Ben and and holes the enough focus that you can read her reactions really well. And Bob's too. He's in the back. But so you get the wider ones. You get you know a looser over, then a tighter, and then a really tight. And you're and some varieties on those. And sometimes now I'm doing more handheld, which I like, but as long as it doesn't bite the comedy. But now, uh, and, and I did a few scenes like this. Uh, I've done more and more of this as I go, but now Judd's kind of gotten DPs to think, because Judd loves this technique where he lo we do a back cross key where the key lights come from the back, right? So that this side isn't all blown out. Sometimes, some people do front cross, but then it really can look too sitcom. -y. But if you, if you light a back cross key, then when I'm shooting his direction with one camera, I can simultaneously shoot the other camera and, uh, his key light is my backlight, and vice versa. So now I can now I don't have to match anything in my scheme well, for Meet the Parents. I had to match everything. She reaches over, touches his hand. It has to match exactly when I turn around, and it did. I noticed in the cut, like yeah, that was pretty well organized. She she was very Terry was very TV. She knew how to match, and right. <clears throat> but once you do scissors, then you can improvise and not really worry. The actors are completely free, at least in that take, to do stuff that would cut exactly like live TV. You could actually cut it. And that's, the DPs have gotten better at that and you can, sh you can work a lot faster. And I've started doing it more and more. I'm a little, I'm a little nervous of it because you do have to compromise. The lighting isn't quite as versatile. And when you start moving, everybody starts moving around, then, then it's really tricky. But when they're just facing each other, it's a great technique and you can get a lot, a lot more funny, really funny stuff in that, that uh, any multiple camera thing is better than just making them. I would have been there six days. Imagine shooting that for six days. Which Someday is, film will really catch up with television. <laughs> yeah, that's true. All right, anything else? I'll show you something else. Yeah, um, yeah um, you know, the timing of, of cuts is so important in comedy. Like, how do you work with as a director with your editors? Uh, 
I let them try things. They, they're cutting while I'm shooting. Usually I, I have fast enough editors that they're, they have a full cut of a movie when I'm done. Uh, usually it's a three hour movie. Um, I come in on the weekends when I'm shooting and work with them and try to give them notes so that the scenes are actually evolving. If they're, if they're up to camera, as they say, if they're cutting fast enough, good editors can be doing versions actually of their own length by the time at the end that some of the scenes are refined. And then I'll go away for a week if I feel not too neurotic and nervous about it. I'll just go away and let them play uh, with a version of the movie to show me, surprise me with things. And then, then it's 20, you know, it's usually about 15 picture cutting weeks and then screening every, once, once you've cut for 10 weeks, you start previewing, and I like to preview every week, so you get three days of picture, a day or two of sound, you know, and you do that for 10 or 15 more weeks and show it as many times as you possibly can. I really, I really love interacting with their audience. And the editors are, uh, con now with Avids, they can try five different versions of the comedy and I make them show me things. I'll, I sit with them uh, a lot. I, I like to be in the editing room, not everybody does, but I, I really like to go through takes and try this take, try that angle, try, let's, you know, expand and contract. And I shoot so modularly, and this is why the coverage is so important. There are jokes we shot in that scene that never made it, that by pulling them out, it's completely seamless. You don't miss them, you don't know what they were. There are jokes that we added in. It's actually, there's a couple things out of order, but, and because they were shot uh, with so much coverage, you know, I'm able to, it's a completely elastic thing. Again, I compromise and I, I kind of miss the chance sometimes of doing really cool theatrical uh, like theater style staging which I do sometimes in the dramas but it, you don't get I just don't have that luxury when I'm Are you able to ever use long takes during on screen? Yeah, um, the car scene that precedes this dinner scene when uh, De Niro's grilling uh, Ben Stiller about uh, whether he smokes dope and whether um, well really whether Puck the Magic Dragon is about drugs or not. Um, that scene, we shot a couple of takes that lasted the whole way through and they, uh, they, they, but I ended up cutting it up anyway, but they, I did do long takes and I could have run the whole scene. It would have played really well as a long take. Do you have actors to teach them how to do Yes, uh, and the good ones memorize it, but I also have uh, my assistant typing, literally doing stenography of every joke that anyone ever tries so that when I turn around I can quickly scan my favorites and have the person feed them because if you don't get the proper response to a particular, I, really, I especially got into trouble with Zach and Will, when you have one improviser you're kind of covered, everyone else is just sort of feeding the straight man lines. But when you have two improvisers, you're, it's so tricky to make them match when you're not doing the scissor thing. When you're doing the scissor thing you're, you're okay, but when you're, you're lining up straight at them you have to get People and here's the story about that. When you shoot, when you commit to shooting one direction, it's a half a day to light it and shoot out. Sometimes, you know, if that's in comedy, you take longer. But if you uh, turn back around, you say, "Okay, that's it. We shot every shot this way. Now we're going to go to lunch. When you come back, it'll be relit, and everybody will will now shoot everything, you know, that direction." So, picture Doctor Evil and Mini Me. Uh, on one end, well actually at that time it wasn't many, just Dr. Evil on one thing and everybody else on the other side, especially Scott Evil in Austin Powers 1. Well we shoot the whole half day and it's sort of playing but it's not, it's just not good enough and I, we're all feeling it and I see Mike doing something with Seth Green off camera where he's, Seth is trying to talk and Mike's going <laughs> <laughs> and so I tell him to try it on camera and it's so funny and we didn't do it the other direction we've already broken out of that day so I had to go back and invest another half day hoping that was going to be as funny to everybody else as it was to me in that moment and I, I had to shoot Seth's side first which was weird but it turned out to be so modular anything Seth said Mike could go and, and then it was then we did it again with Mini Me with, which was Zip It and Zip It E whatever he did a whole nother run of it on the second film but the first one, I didn't see it coming, and it wasn't in the script. And that's when, if I'd had scissors, it would have been so great because I, I, you know, had that scissor angle of shooting. Uh, but we didn't, we didn't have it. Okay, is this interesting? Let's let's um uh any okay. So let's watch one other thing. Um, so um, let's see.
In that section, Stan, oh, I know how to find out. <coughs> I'm going to not drop the mic. Sorry, I keep looking at my computer, but I put my paper somewhere else. Okay, so we're going to do a section that starts with the tuck shop uh, and goes through um, the volleyball thing. And this has a number of... Um, is that one on my screen? Okay, so would you start at um, uh, 004940 now? So the things you need to know is that Greg has, to, has had to quit smoking because Jack sees smoking as a sign of weakness. Um, Greg found out that she, uh, Pam is engaged to Kevin at that dinner, and um, we, uh, we shot this scene, this first scene, and then it'll go into the, to the pool scene. Um, completely uh, one whole way and then completely reshot it a totally different way. And again, what, it's an example of the pain of the hardest decision as a director to say, everything we just did, we're throwing it out. We're starting here because this is funnier. And I'll tell you what that was um, after the series. So, uh, 004940, yeah. 49 minutes yeah. in. All right, Sam, let's give it a yeah. the waters. Yeah. yeah. Well, the logistics of it were, were uh, tricky. It was, it, you know, but you. Um, yeah, it's a good question. My, my DP really helped me there. He built a cool uh, rolling um, tray that hooked to both sides of the pool and I could roll along. And uh, I came up with a pretty good solve. We got there. Most pools have a deep end and a shallow end, and I suggested building a platform that kept them all at four. It was about four feet deep, you know, the entire thing. And that that you know. But in terms of rehearsal, you just. You, I, I actually learned something at USC, actually. A great professor I had here named Ken Robinson was my 310, uh, what was called 310, is that still yeah. what it's called? Uh, you know, the, the, at that time it was 60 millimeter film, non-stick sound, and he was a ma he's an editor, and he was a master of shooting shot, reverse shot, which is sort of like what we're talking about in, in dialogue scenes. But if you can stage action in a bipolar, you know, on, on an axis, and, and really shoot out a side and then shoot out the other side and stage everything as, a sh as an action reaction. You definitely have to get some variation on it when the women, when, the, when, the, when he spikes the ball into where Blythe's sitting and she jumps in the pool, that's a different axis. But almost everything else is shot with Jack on the right, like a football game. It's, and, and, once, and I, it, it's easy to demonstrate in a volleyball game, but I actually use that quite a bit in comedy for any kind of action sequence because it enables you to shoot quickly, to not have to rehearse much, to shoot, to start shooting right away. Uh, and I do something weird where I start, most DPs make them start at wide and work in. I start on the action, on the closer shots and work out and make the DPs figure it out, which tortures them because they, it's very difficult to match the lighting uh, in the close-ups. You light it for the close-up and it looks great and then you get back and you realize you can't get the lights where they need to be. But Why, they, why they, do you do that exactly? Because they're, that way I can actually, I don't have to, lock down every single oh, bit of the choreography, of I can course. start going on That's performance first. And also you can go to the key moments. And I, can, and I can allow for flexibility. If you lock them in on the wide shot, yeah. and they haven't even really gotten into the scene yet, right. you're, you're kind of, you're really uh, limiting what they will do. And, but if you get into the scene and say, okay, what can you do? These are your close-ups, don't hold back. Woody Harrelson once said to me, I'm not even gonna start working until you get into triple digits, mm -hmm. uh, until it's a 100 millimeters or longer. And a lot of actors, he's the first one who said it, but a lot of actors feel that way even without telling you. But they won't start working until their close-ups are <laughs> coming. And especially com comedians know when their, their killer shots are up. And they really don't have the adrenaline going. to, And so you start locking them in when the, they're kind of half into it in the wider shots. Anyway, so I did not try to lock in all the choreography of the game. And I knew my... Actually, I, again, I learned from Ken at that time because even my... 310. I I didn't quite do a Hitchcock on it where I knew where every shot started and every shot stopped in terms of cutting in the camera. I never do that. I always run as much as I can all the way through. But I had storyboarded enough to know exactly what I needed out of every 
set up and I had done that, I again mapped it out. I knew exactly where every guy would stand, every person would stand. I knew exactly where the, the, the big moments would be. And, uh, you know, and I had to fight with, uh, I had to worry about them being cold. I mean, it was a, shooting in water is difficult. But I, again, I, I got behind a little bit, but I, um, you know, we, I keep talking about being behind. We ended up finishing that film exactly on schedule, but the key moments you really, you really put your time in and you, you're glad you did, even though the studio's freaking out. Which brings me to one key thing I meant to emphasize. The mantra I say to myself every morning, and especially in prep, but when I'm shooting, is script and cast, script and cast, script and cast. Everything else doesn't matter. Anything I came up with about that pool, how I shot it, will never matter as much as De Niro being that into testing Ben Stiller's, you know, being high or not, or, or and that and, and that's what made this movie I think better than the other ones I've tried is that I had such a good uh, script and such a good uh, cast and uh, a, con a controlling idea that I told you before, and two characters who were so motivated. Ben Stiller wants so desperately to have that girl. And we had to, by the way, when we first tested it, people didn't get why, he didn't get, we didn't get the, that he was that attracted to her. And um, if you ever see the film again, watch the opening sequence as a home movie. We shot that after the last preview we shot a home, I gave the camera to her, Terry Cole's boyfriend and said, go shoot some footage of your wife in a bikini, uh, flirting with her in the bedroom, in a park, just go shoot some home movie stuff. And she looked so great, it was so adorable. And I ran that under the Randy Newman song. Yeah. And it, it the, the preview numbers, we were in the 70s, jumped Shut to the high 80s, wow. and just off of that, because they understood what drove him to want to, to win over the father-in-law to be with her. That's a really big lesson because if he doesn't care that much, there's no anxiety. There's no the, the anxiety moments like when he says, "You guys laughed probably one of the hardest laughs uh, I've measured the laughs even today." Uh, was when he said, "I Jack, I have no idea what we're talking about." And I was after a crazy long pause, and the reason that pause works is you know he wants to say something that's gonna make it work, and he doesn't know anymore what the hell is going on, um, and that's because. Great script, great cast, and by great script, I mostly mean, even though they're improvising a lot of that dialogue, it's a, a concept, a, a, a predicament, a, dr a set of motors and engines and the characters that make you root for them to figure it out and make you worry for them, like, oh, he's a lying sack, and now De Niro's on him. And How's that going to work out? The <laughs> actor's commitment to those goals. Exactly. They're just they're going for broke. Yeah. And now, and this is a, here's what the other thing the actors can do, and the writers, I always have writers with me, I love writers, directors have been taught for so many years to not have the writers around, because uh, we're the auteurs, and we get to say what we want, do what we want, it's, for, have your writers with you, if you're a director, all the time, because the writers, this, the quality of the script is going to make it work or not, and I have writers there, even though we're improvising, and in, the writer's improvising too, and I'm shouting stuff at the actors, but that day, uh, this is what else your actors can do. We shot a version of that scene where they were just out in the floor, and Bob said, "This just I don't feel I don't know what's going on. It's not working." He was he was finding he couldn't find the scene really, and he you know he was really cool about that. He loves being directed and he loves the collaboration. And so why don't we shoot it in one of the dressing rooms? And I panicked because you can't get cameras in those dressing rooms. They were, they were as big as a phone booth. I mean, there was no way, and we didn't have any sets. We had no construction. You didn't build that? We did not build that. That was on, Those are location. The tuck shop was on a location. So uh, I was like, oh, he's right. And, and that's the most sinking feeling is that you, I was, I guessed wrong about what Robert Zero might do best and how he might do it. And I, I was like, oh, my heart sank. I was totally stressed. I'm working with Robert De Niro. It's probably the most stressful experience you can have anyway. But I was scared that day. Like, I really screwed this up. And we just cracked it by shooting into a corner, an up angle, in one side of the room, and shooting into Ben uh, in the in yeah, another corner. The on the door side, how, where do you have we, the camera? We popped them out, just, and just, that's just for that one shot, that's the only time they're actually in the booth, but we made it. I mean, I assumed assume. you closed the door and then did it with a yeah. one with a two-fold, you know, just no, a No, yeah, it was not a set, we, we improvised it all been easy to do it that way. I know, <laughs> but I didn't think of it. That's what I meant by, oh, I was wrong, we should get on the stage. Ouch. Um, and then, uh, what else was I going to tell you? And then I'll take a couple quick questions. Um, oh, the, the interesting thing about cast, script and cast, script and cast, is that I think about casting all day long, every second when I'm in prep, and it's stressful, but 
it's great when you land on what the idea should be. We were, tr for the Owen Wilson part, we were looking at Jerry McConnell, a very, I don't know if you know, he is a very ca uh, kind of frat boy quarterback type guy, really good looking, a guy who would be intimidating to Ben Stiller, of course, right? You'd get the, the all American guy. And my wife said, you should get Owen Wilson. I said, like, you know, he's not, he's not the all American guy. He's got a weird nose and he's not buff and Ben's way buffer. We, ben showed up with those muscles and I panicked. I was like, Ben, you're buff. You can't walk out looking like that. You're, you've got more muscles than, you know, anybody I know. He's like, he was so ripped. And I made him stand in front of the fern and look, you know, to hide that. But Owen Wilson was a breakthrough when we got him because he, his charm and charisma was intimidating. Just a stereotypical handsome guy would have been so much less good and but that that the the uh, second thing that an actor did for me was we couldn't figure out how to stage that swimming suit scene i was going to cut to ben wearing it and ben had the idea of chewing the gum as that's good and just staring yeah. at it to build the anticipation it's like mother effer you stuck me with that it's a trap he knows it's a trap it's never going to go well and then so when did the when and that was in rehearsal. When that was in rehearsal. rehearsal. That conversation and it came out of that yeah, conversation. Came out of him not wanting to wear. I want. I had a white one, a white oh. speedo. <laughs> I, I love your face, Jessica, because that, that's what I knew would happen. People would go, "Oh shit!" But he didn't want to wear a white one, and so it, that started the debate. And I, he almost. And this is good. It was good experience because I had to sit there and argue for my side of it, and he wanted to. Uh, he wanted to wear. Uh, uh, regular surfer trunks, you know, and I was like, no, 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 you don't have to wear the white one, but I'll give you a color. So the co the colored one was the compromise. Uh, the other great thing that uh, the Wardrobe, this was on the day. Oh, on the day. Wardrobe yeah, I, was ready. I'm, I actually Wardrobe went and got sh she trunks, was, surfer trunks out of my trailer. I happened to have some that that were mine. But wardrobe and, was ready with wardrobe was, was, had choices. Actually, they went to the store. You you have to. Yeah, we had a really great wardrobe, and they went and got those colored ones because I only had the white ones and. And, but the other, the thing, they were, so he was right. That Again, you listen to smart guys, you work with actors who also directed, which was, was great to write on their ideas. He was wrong about something that I remember today, is that he did not, he wanted to go to the girl who got the bloody nose and stand with her, and, and I, I wanted the entire family holding her and looking oh, back at him. He was outside net. the circle as well, the, the whole exactly. Right. I mean, that was not in that circle yet. And that was a huge thing. And that's a kind of thing in rehearsal. You just bite it out and you make, you try to win the argument. And that's, you got to know the controlling idea, though. He's tried so hard. That scene is all bent on him being goaded and goaded. And Glenn, you know, keep your, you know, keep your eye on the ball, Glenn. It's Greg. It's not, Glenn. you know, all those things were, there's so many layers. He's, he's being suspected of being on dope. Um, doctor, the two guys are doctors. He's a nurse, and Doctor Larry's on him constantly, calling him Panama Red. Gr Owen Wilson is uh, super charming, and and they share this lingo about Top Gun, which he's never heard. There's like eight things, and it's all there to get laughs, but mostly to distract you. That what's really gonna be about is smacking a girl in the face with a ball volleyball, <laughs> and that's comedy. If you can. If you can juggle all these things and deliver the one big thing and have people think, oh man, I did not see that coming, but it's inevitable and it's, it's better than I expected. If you don't get inevitable and better than expected, inevitable is key because otherwise it's just cheesy and forced. And but you have to trump the expectation. And the only way to trump the expectation is not is to divert attention to all these other things. Otherwise they'll start to see it coming and know what it's about, and then it's then it just hacky. That, in which I've also done many versions of that too. <laughs> um, okay, any questions about? Uh, I'm just curious, how did you sound uh, in the pool? It sounds kind of tricky. Uh, how did you do that? Sound? Yeah. You know, uh, that's a good question. A lot of it's uh, looped. A lot of it, the water was so loud. A lot of the off-screen lines, we kept getting laughs whenever someone would say, "Fucker," you know. <laughs> so we, I was like, we can't say "fucker" more times. Oh yes, we can. And we kept sticking it in, and a lot of the, and it was always getting. De Niro yelling at him uh, for being a, a wimpy volleyball player just delighted everybody. So, but the, most of that was laid in after the fact. The dialogue when they're in the one of my favorite parts is when they're in that little huddle and they're actually looking directly into the camera. I made them. I got it multiple different ways just because I didn't. You never know. 
but the version where they look in the camera and your his eyes, you know, the camera's his eyes, then McCall and you know, all Panama Red and all that stuff. Um, yeah, anyway, so, uh, yeah, the sound wasn't too big of a thing. I knew that was going to be an issue, and I was ready. I, I, I kind of was ready for that. I love working on the sound aspect of it. Okay. Did you end up having to do um, the scene where uh, where uh, Spencer is hugging the girl and then his his legs and your legs? No, I didn't. But that's a good question. Sometimes you do that, and it's worth it. If the actor has a plan and you want to... You, you know that they might enjoy it enough to be better because they were doing it their way. You, you might take the time required to do that. And I, I never, and I'm, because again, you don't know for sure. And you just, as long as you don't use up your time, we often shoot the scripted version. I'll shoot a, another, you know, version. And then I, as long as I, at the end of the day, kind of know what it is and I get the version I want. Because again, that's the, that's the other supremely hard decision, not just when to blow off stuff you've already done, but the hardest, many directors say this, I'm not at all the first one to say, the hardest job is to say, cut, print, we got it, moving on. And you, you, until you've shot the versions everybody thinks might work in comedy, which is very different from my drama experience, it's so much easier, uh, you don't know. And so you get them all. And, and that's, you know, that sounds kind of sloppy. And if, when you visited our set, you say, this is sloppy, because these guys don't know what they want. Well, when I'm in the cutting room, I, that's when I that's when I really do figure out what I want and um, try to get it. I just wanted to say, <clears throat> this scene when you talk about the comedy and the drama aspect, the commitment from the actors was so great that if the just the nature of the script mm -hmm. was different, the same way the actors played it, it could have easily gone into almost drama. Sure. So I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about. Um, tone of that tone performance, of your, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. Tone of performance, mm -hmm. and did you find yourself having to have individual language to help the actors Each get one. on the same page mm -hmm. because of their background? Do you mean individual language from me to the actor? Just in terms Be of between the two different actors with different yeah, backgrounds in terms of yeah, yeah, yeah. Where everybody's coming from, the same, the same thing. Oh, and well, uh, it's a good question. Coming exactly. from different places, yeah. Exactly. Schools, of yeah. That's a very good question. Um, Working with Bob was very different from working with Ben uh, for a, l a number of reasons, but you hit on the most important one. Um, Bob is an amazing actor, and he turns out to be an amazing comedian, but he's way less sure what's funny than Ben is. Ben knows what's funny, and he could, every single take of Ben. In that, in that, uh, in, in that um, tuxedo shot, I have probably, that scene's, I don't know, probably a 90 second scene, a minute and a half scene. Maybe it's longer, three minutes or something. I don't know. But I have easily 45 minutes of the most unbelievable Ben Stiller performance and every moment could have been in the scene if, if, it, if I had that scene because he was awesome. I have a reverse of Bob probably for as much footage and I'd say 5% of it was even usable. The rest was fishing, finding things. And that's what makes it so stressful when you work with someone like that, especially if he's not used to comedy, He's just looking for what it is, and he doesn't know. And it, it was so great for me because I have Robert De Niro. I hear myself in the dailies go, oh, can we try one a little straighter? Now can you try? And I'm actually saying to myself, shut up. You're talking to Robert De Niro. But he loved being directed from off camera. We wouldn't cut. He doesn't. He likes to stay in it. So I go, okay, uh, still rolling. Pick it up from this. So still rolling, go again from the top. You know, and, and he would just keep doing it, keep doing it. And... Most of them were, some of them are very muggy, surprisingly, from a guy like that. Some of them are very flat, some of them are whatever. But when he is just engaged, like he would be for his drama, and that's usually what I would say to him, is we try it, just try it straight once, Bob. That take was often the one. And, and as we all know, when you get the one for Robert De Niro, it's freaking awesome. It's the, it's the most amazing thing you've ever seen. And that's, that's what I found with him. Ben always nailing it. Terry Polo always nailing it. She's kind of amazing as a, she didn't have a very, she had kind of thankless part. And if she's in the shot with Ben in a two shot and she's not on, and I have to blow a take of his great performance because she was off in some way, ooh, man, would it be, I'd be cursing her in my, under my breath. She never, always nails it. And that's, so, and the other question about where, how to talk to them, I would generally talk to Bob in very technical ways, faster, slower, straighter, with Ben, I would say, okay, here's what you're thinking about. What do you think of that? Here's, what do you think, of, you know, are you, do you, 
are you a good liar or are you bad? Like we talk conceptually and more about objective. And Bob really surprisingly is a method as everybody thinks he is, prefers to work from the outside in. He was very interested in his props and his the way his handkerchief is folded and his jacket, the way his glasses were unfolded. And he finds the part in the minutia of the exterior. The glasses were amazing. Yeah, yes, and, and or the hat. He put on this hat in this final chase. There's a beret. I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I didn't know what to say. You know, they always, they bring the, at wardrobe people bring the actors to the set. You're lit, you're ready to go. And then someone puts on the thing that he's like, oh, huh. Okay, and you can tell if an actor's really married to it, and I could tell he was, and I was like, oh man. And it was great. It was, he thinks of himself as a kind of a, he has these black gloves, and he's like suddenly sophisticated and artsy instead of being kind of. I, I just have to share with you guys every, every time yeah. we get into something here, I, my back is so tight right now. I get so <laughs> tense when I hear you go a half a day over, and I'm thinking about what the, he's just your third picture and what the studio is thinking, and the. Oh, Hounds of hell are, are breathing down you, and it, this is this is this is yeah. a, a, a high wire. Act. There's a map of every movie's disasters on the inside of my stomach lining. I swear to God, they're still there, and they all flare up just when I start talking about it too. But I but it is fun when you now it looks easy. At the time, there were tears, there were there were meltdowns, there were, there were fights, you know, and it's yeah, it's it's. It's amazing when it clicked, and but it doesn't. And I got spoiled in those early ones. I thought, oh, this is awesome. It really clicks. And then you realize, oh yeah, actually the fights don't always end up in having it go exactly the way you want it in, in the later films. But if you have a strong controlling idea, it often does. Yeah, what was the uh, you know, it's deceptive. As I was saying earlier about the coverage, I I shoot. Um, I, do, I, I usually only do a couple takes and then I change it so they change the take count again. But if you, if you just count of takes looking one direction for a general, like the medium shots, and there was a whole range of them, I probably end up doing 20 takes or something. I don't, I'm not, there are Yeah, not on things. each side, so you mean just yeah. all together. Yeah, all together. So one direction on the, on the hero thing, like t 10 to 20 takes. And I, I usually, when I finally feel like it's starting to work, I'll go to the actor pretty early in when I feel like it's starting working, and I'll say, I've kind of got what I need would you like to try a few more things? And they, knowing that they'll always say, yes, I would like to try a few more things. I start, I kind of say I have what I need before I might not have what I need, knowing that some more better stuff is about to come. And when you release the actor and say, you know, I, this is for you, let's play, let's try stuff. You get the most amazing stuff and they, they really love to have the, the play taste. How do you deal with that pressure that burnout was Speaking about when you have your line producers that keep threatening, yeah. threatening to get fired every minute, like how do you do? How do you deal with that and still? Yeah, stay committed I, you know, I deal with it a, a very specific way, just to how I work. I have respect for everybody's job. I love the line producers, and I lo even the studio budget people. I get to know them because I'm, you know, I have a degree in economics. I know everything is a trade-off. If I shoot a lot here, I'm gonna have to pay for it later. I'm not a director who says. Screw you! I, this is funny. Just sit over there, and I'll tell you when I'm done. And because we'll, they're they're up against it, they're trying to, and, and you get if you get too belligerent about it, I don't like the the uh, morale issues that emerge from the sense that you're about to get shut down. Or and some directors actually love that because they it gives them a sense of power. I like figuring out how to make it work within the box. I've gone over on certain things, on the Austin things, we started going over because we were under so much pressure to d deliver, you know, and especially I think Mike felt it even more than I did. We went, a, we went several days over on both those sequels, but on all the other ones, I, I kind of go with, you know, what it is, and I, and I, I uh, work with the line producer as a partner in the creative puzzle of how to get the most for every dollar I spend. It w I might buy a day by giving up a crane or some more than a, a day is like a you know, quarter of a million dollars. So I have to give up a lot to buy a whole day of shooting. But I will give that up to buy. There, there's a scene in Meet the Parents. There's, a, there's one of my favorite scenes that I won't show tonight, which is uh, the, ra the chase. De Niro, uh, Stiller finds the cat, but it's an imposter cat. He lies about it. De Niro knows he's lying. They race to the house to get the cat. And I, I, we had a five-day... Ronin level De Niro <laughs> chase that was flipping cars and uh, 
an unbelievable stunt driving thing that would have broken the budget. And I, because I was behind, they said, you have to do it in two days. So I went to the location, and, and it was scripted as, and I had storyboarded it, and it was a kick-ass chase, you know, and De Niro, and Bit Stiller was finally gonna show his, his masculinity and stand up to De Niro and, and was gonna almost win and then lose. <laughs> so I went to the location, uh, we, we all looked around, and we go, well, we can light, you know, a quarter of the distance, we thought, but notice that these intersections, it was in Port Washington and on Long Island, these intersections are about 50 yards long. If these are sort of uh, middle class, uh, upper middle class guys who are worried about following the law, they might race from when the light turns green and stop when the light turns red. <laughs> and that's what it became. It was a joke about, it was an anti-chase. I can't believe that that was, a, see that's a perfect example of and that was me. I, I'll take credit for that one because I, and usually I get, because I have so many great people contributing. I literally stood there and said, I know how to do this. I'm going to, every scene is going to be like this. You know, and that was it. And so we did that three times. At the last one, De Niro turns left when he think, uh, Ben thinks in the last challenge he's going to race in the last straightaway and beats him just by, because Greg's so caught up in the race. He, uh, I can't believe that because I grew up on Long Island right yeah. there, and that's just Jewish drag racing. You wouldn't go down a red light. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, I can't that's, remember, I that's wish as I'd have far that. as you'll go. I wish I'd had that title. I could have explained it a lot. <laughs> Um, but that was an example where my, uh, I did not say to the studio, which I could have, you know, you leave me alone, I'll get it, you'll make a lot of money, just leave me alone, I'll figure it out, you, if it's over, you'll, you'll... The other thing that happens, though, that you, that's, that's tough to do, you made it sound so easy, but you've got such an investment in the planning of yeah. that, oh that my God, I know. the work that you went to think up and to plan yeah. that, that a lot of people, it's very hard to let go of that. Yeah, I mean, that, it's a huge really part of, especially nowadays, it's a huge part of the filmmaking process is the, um, here it is, is the, uh, the redesigning through prep when you start doing something and uh, have to, you know, s whittle it down to the budget that is, uh, you know, a quarter of what you thought it was going to be, and you end up having to, you know, to completely redesign. You know, I'll, if you guys want, um, I'll happily share some copies of these um, the storyboards. But this, this is the, this is the, the storyboard section of that pool, and you'll see I prep every single, every single shot that I know I'm going to need is drawn, and plus about another 25% or more of them, you know, that I'm, I'm going to get just to give myself choices. And there's, there's hundreds of these shots. Um, for this scene, I ended up going over this day, as I told you, because I over covered it. I over, you know, I over uh, designed it, and I had to shrink it back on the spot and come up with a new cutting plan while we were there to to make it flow. But I had to do that on that on that. S I spent weeks story storyboarding the action scenes because that's what they make you storyboard because they're trying to figure out how to, you know, to build all the stunt rails and the. And I just threw it all out, and you know, and it's just, it's just having again. If you have a, a commitment to the, uh, to the, to the controlling idea, and you know what you're doing, you can, you can make decisions. If you don't, and you show up, and this is a trend, and I've fallen for it a couple times now, uh, where they start movies without the scripts, being locked, and they say, "Don't worry, you'll come up with it as you shoot." You're so screwed, and then it triples the ulcery feeling as you shoot. Um, any other ones about that that, that stuff? Okay. Yeah. Do you do your own storyboards or do you work with a storyboard artist? I work with storyboard artists. I, I can draw enough to uh, do, he you know, s stick figures and heads, but I can't draw like this at all. I have an, a really amazing guy now. This guy was great too. Um, this guy, Gabriel Hardman, was my, uh, my guy through all the Austin Powers films and Meet the Parents. Um, but I, what I do is, I, uh, what I do myself is a bird's eye plan with every shot drawn on multiple sheets, you know, I'll, okay, now they move here, and now this is what the layout looks like with little circles and kind of an overhead plan. And then when I'm sitting with the storyboard, I'll say, okay, so we're going to write, and I don't just draw the shot, I draw the editorial pattern, I draw how, the progression. So there's, there's a panel in here for every sh cut, not just every shot so that I <coughs> run the movie in my head and know what the steps required to set up the joke and pay off the joke or set up the character moment. 
Um, and, and then I sit with the guy and then I'll say, okay, this one's looking from this angle, it's over this person. And then I act it out. I actually act that. And sometimes I make him take a picture of me doing the pose or whatever because I want him to get the, get the thing right. And I've so in a way, you've walked through the action I've rehearsed yourself. it myself. You've played all the parts yeah. in a way. And I mostly only do it with uh, action scenes. Um, what time do you guys want to stop? It's 8:30. I'll keep going, uh, and but I I want to go. Okay with you? Yeah, you guys. Want to okay, yeah, you can all. You can. Say, any of you can leave, and you won't offend me if you get sleepy and not off. I'll, I'll, I'll keep talking. But I have a um, I have one more clip that's a more uh, choreographed and kind of carefully. There's a carefully uh, designed and very tricky sh sequence, and the n the night before I shot it, I can't remember how how. Uh, far into the shoot, but it, was, it couldn't have been more than a week. The writer called and said, you are screwing this up. You're going to screw this up. You've built way too many events into, because I'd rewritten the original writer, um, I, I, not me, but this guy, Jim Hersfeld, wrote an amazing script based on an old film, which nobody told me it was based on an old film until eight weeks before we started shooting this. There was a 70-minute featurette that didn't have any resemblance to this, really, except the concept. And they said, oh, yeah, these other guys are producers, too. I go, who are they? Oh, they did the original film. What are you talking about? <laughs> there was a whole film called Meet the Parents that was at a film festival. Anyway, uh, Jim Hersfeld adapted from that film, wrote almost all the great trailer moments, the volleyball, the, the uh, I mean, almost the cat peeing in the ashes. And this guy, John Hamburg, who's a director, too, directed Along Came Polly, I Love You, Man, was the writer and came in and did a character thing that just, it, it just made it so much better. And then uh, Alexander Payne wrote the third act, uh, a big hunk of the third act, including um, Ben Stiller going and not being able to get on the airplane. Uh, and the poem, the poem that De Niro reads about his dead mother. <laughs> That's Alexander Payne, which is <laughs> um, He wrote a whole script that was, compl he, he, uh, eight weeks before shooting, he turned in a draft that was an entirely different movie we paid him for a big rewrite, him and Jim Taylor, his partner. Yeah. Ke Owen Wilson's friends showed up. There was a, there was a whole bunch of new characters. It was, and I only used the poem and uh, uh, Ben trying to get on the plane, which turned out to be huge because the original third act was very over the top and not great. And Alexander saved us, by, but, he, but he, uh, it almost became an entirely different movie. Um, OK, so I'll show you the, uh, just real quick the, the sequence um, where Ben comes back with the cat and is um, going to convince De Niro that this is Jinx, even though we've seen that he's gonna, he's, he sees a cat that sort of looks like Jinx, and he's responsible for losing Jinx. But uh, he he um, he doesn't uh, he, he he finds a, a fake cat. The whole so, okay, thing. so kicking at the thing, kicking at the gutter of leaves. And uh, that the that the cigarette and it, it's very close to being too silly because who throws a cigarette like that and but we'd set up this whole thing that he goes up there to smoke and I just thought you know the audience would like the ride of him trying that hard and, and slowly creating so many Rube Goldberg disastrous things uh, that you would enjoy the the you know the thing. Well, so each, th each thing is connected to a real goal. Yeah, that he's really committed to from way back. Starting with the second, and I like the know, layers. It's what I said about the thing. I like. I know the hope is going to catch on fire, but if you know, if you see that coming and you don't, you know. So I love well, spinning the plates. Huge misdirect, a huge yeah, mislead that's because that's of that's his concern. He's got a guy on his tail, and now he thinks he understands something about, or he yeah. got the goods on talking tie, talking tie. So that, that completely that. takes our mind off of. The, yeah. We think that's where we're going. And that's, so that, the writers, uh, you know, were very good at that stuff of just creating, and I just threw in a few more plates to spin because I thought the, the, the sort of acrobatic act would be more fun if there were a few more plates. And it was really complex to do that wire, um, and there's so much hanging off of roofs, and that was a real slate roof. It wasn't, uh, we had them up in a precarious situation. We had a real cat that, you know, all that stuff. And I was so <laughs> happy. And it's storyboarded frame for frame, you know, so that I wouldn't get lost in it. And, um, and that's how we did it. Oh, I was going to say two quick things. One, there are jokes in this movie that don't work at all. And one of them is the bag of S&M stuff. I hated that scene so much. And I hated all the props. And I just 
got stuck with it and I never got to go back and reshoot. I still hate them and I don't think they're funny because it's so hacky. And uh, there well, was it's no, not connected to anything else. It's not connected to anything else. It's that's supposed really to just show it makes and it doesn't come back. It's never, just a funny used. hat. Yeah. That's that's what it's a funny it's hat. A, it's just something that is generically funny and it's not connected and that yeah. bonds you. Everything and it else is been, connected. Yeah. The rest is drama. Exactly. I mean, the truth if it, if it had, is, now that I would have designed it now to incriminate Stiller in a way that could be plausible from De Niro's point of view, but there's no evidence. Well, that like ever had the connection to the pot and stuff. Yeah, like exactly. It doesn't build on anything else. Exactly it's a right. standalone. But everything you've been talking about, I just every single thing you've been talking about, the issues with De Niro's character, the issues with Still, they are playing. They're they're playing straight drama. Somewhat. Yeah, you try. I mean, there's things I look at that I know are, you know, a little forced. But again, farce likes farce and a little bit of ever so slightly campy stuff like the cat with the white tail. That's a pure farce move. You know, there's no, that's almost so coincidental that you wouldn't get away with it in a drama. But I like, I do like that you do get away with it sometimes when people want to laugh and uh, you just have to find the in the previews where you're where you're gonna lose. The other thing that we found in previews that we had to cut out an entire scene where Ben is crawling along, crawling under the house in a crawl space, uh, chasing that cat, and it was a really elaborate thing, and it had its own set of uh, kind of good comedy uh, set pieces, and I totally forgot that we left him completely dirty on top of the house yeah, with no reason. There's no explanation for why he's so filthy already. <laughs> Um, but that was but it. Nobody's cares. crawling. Yeah, no, but no nobody cares. Cares. Um, I just wanted to ask, like, how difficult or not difficult is it working with animals? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, in that whole scene, part of what makes it so funny is that the cat keeps running away sure. from him or, you know, his interaction with You know, cat. it's all, I've put animals in everything. We, you know, Mr. Bigglesworth, the hairless cat. I was on the, we were the cover of Cat Magazine, you know, for two different films. Like, we, we have, we're cat people, and I'm, I really am, I'm not a cat person. Uh, and uh, we also have you, the, vul the vulture and the schmucks, uh, and actually, you know, because I like, I guess I like the challenge, and I think the actors are thrown by the, the cats and the animals. Spot had to corral those cats, there's three of them playing, jinx. They were not predictable. Cats Sometimes are not easy. Cats, no. cats don't. And I didn't know you could train them. I didn't, we wrote in there the cat yeah, runs and jumps into his. You can't. That cat ran on, on thing, jumps the thing, and jumps in his. So head. when the tail flicks, was that an animate? Was that a puppet, or was that? That's or, a real cat. That we really you just got. Yeah. We have. They were trained. They were cats. able to. They're insanely that. trained. They. He could fit. He could flush the toilet. We got a cat. <laughs> <laughs> but you. You just don't. You don't kind of expect to be able to, but you can train. We trained a vulture, you know, how, how likely is that? <laughs> and it's true that the animal trainer people are miracle workers, and if you can throw a wild card like that into a scene, when we rehearsed in Dinner for Schmucks, there's a vulture that sits next to Steve Carell, and it's almost as tall as him when sitting in the chair, and it will peck your eyes out. They demonstrated that it can chomp through a bone, you know, like take your finger off. And I put it right next to the seat. <laughs> and I did not know, and the because it had a perch, it was going to be off in the corner, and I was like, they're not going to be flustered by that. I need them flustered by this freaking bird. What I didn't know was that the bird digests food incredibly quickly. So it's just pooping the entire time, <laughs> farting, and just like it's sitting right next to Steve. I have so many takes of him, but whoa, he's going to and then it attacks him. And, they were like on edge <laughs> the crew was so pissed at me when I did that because it just meant oh we're not going to go home early tonight and we didn't for three straight nights because that bird was uh, tricky but it adds a layer of unpredictability and are not staged not and look I want to say too I'm talking about these films not because I think they're you know all masterpieces at all they're they're so flawed and they're I'm just saying as a person who's been through the fire trying to make people laugh there these are tips on how to do it I don't I think I've there you sh one thing you can get from this is that you can get away with a certain level of imperfection and still have a career <laughs> so and there's a lot of bad stuff in these so I don't I, I don't want you to think I'm here analyzing you know Susan Cain I'm just telling you there's jokes that work and there's jokes that don't and I can some of them I can give you some clues on how to well, write your jokes. There's a lot of work on the jokes. It's, you know, 
can't take anything away from that. But what I'm hearing is there's a lot of work on the structure. There's a lot of, a lot of work on the fundamental character concepts. You know, it has to work on all these levels. I like levels. I talk. People get sick of me saying it. It needs more levels. It needs some other place. And I don't. I get bored if it's too linear and there's not. You know, it's not just one level because I think it actually helps the comedy to uh, to keep the eyes in. I just want to ask you. I want to ask you one question. Sure. Maybe we can. But um, you, you said cast and script, cast and script, cast and script. You worked with Ellen Chenoweth on this one, I think, right? Yeah, it was Terri amazing. Terrific casting. Yeah, they're like the Coen Brothers and yeah, a million other great film director. What did she bring? What did you, did you discover anything in casting you didn't know beforehand? Well, the Owen, ca the Owen choice, which she didn't come up with, but she, uh, you know, she, she got it immediately. Um, but everybody else, uh, you know, that guy who plays the two doctors, you know, Tom McCarthy plays the young doctor. Jim Rapport. Rapport. A great director. Well, think. Yeah, to McCarthy, and then you had Jim Rapport plays the Jim Rapport plays the dad. Phyllis George, of all people, plays their wife, you know, his wife, and her, the other guy's mom. And, um, no, I, I thought they did a great job with casting uh, everybody. The one part we didn't cast, which always happens until the very last minute, was Terry Polo. We... Uh, I don't know if I should reveal uh, some of the people that almost got that part, but there were some big name people, and they kept getting shot down. But I had so many voices, and in, in, in this happens in casting, especially in television, but even in features. And I had movie stars who had cast approval, and so I just kept getting people, unbelievable people, some of whom become gigantic stars, and who just weren't pretty enough, weren't funny enough, weren't whatever from their point of view, which were my first choices that just kept getting yeah, funny. Like ding because by Terry, because she was there, you know, and was very, very uh, solid, you know, and just, was, and, you know, attractive and cool. and. But anyway, um, yeah, so she, and she, she, everything else, except for De Niro, uh, she helped me find life, Danner, who I a great casting choice. Um, the other kid, uh, that guy, I love that guy who's the the pet, the, the animal shelter guy. You know, every one of those one line. I, I spend a ton of time in casting. I go in and audition them myself. I direct them myself because I want to know what they're going to be able to do. And those those one or two or three line characters sometimes. That guy, uh, uh, Judah Friedlander, who plays... Uh, the drugstore guy who gives him the mom champagne, that was one of his first films. And you know, a lot of cool people have come through our film, which I'm always excited. He's on uh, he's on Thirty Rock. Thirty Rock, yeah. One of the writers. What were the few controlling ideas for Well, I I, t I told you I was gonna tell you after, but I told you at the beginning. It was just that, that idea of a guy who tries too hard that he's gonna lie and sneak around and meets uh, a human lie detector. But the main thing was and it's based on my own life. My father-in-law, to be, when I met my wife, was a shrink, a famous shrink, I guess. I didn't know it at the time. I would have been even more nervous. And I, you know, I, the script had been around, but the stuff of the human lie detector stuff was not in the movie until I came on. Wow. Because I tried so hard to impress him, but I was afraid he had x-ray vision, because shrinks have x-ray vision, right? I mean, that's in my, I grew up in New Mexico. I didn't, I never had a shrink. I didn't know what they could, I, I knew he would see that I was a bullshitter, because I am a bullshitter. <laughs> <laughs> he would, and he would see through my lame jokes about psychology, which I told, like, five bad ones, or he would, he would, I don't know, just, that, and that I wasn't, my wife is a, is a rock star. I mean, I was a, I wasn't even a, I was a. He means literally a rock yeah, star. Yeah, she's not a Ben off from the Bengals, and I, I didn't. I couldn't. I still don't know why. She, I was a blind date. I don't know why. I was. I don't know how it worked. So I just like how. How am I going to keep this together? It's already fragile. She'll figure out that you know. I was a te I was teaching here. That was when I met her, and I was writing a, a really lame sci-fi uh, series um, that no one had even seen, and somehow I've got to convince her father that I'm the guy for her. I had a motorcycle and a VW bus that caught on fire probably three out of every eight times I drove it. <laughs> the back, the back was, you had a horrible carburetor that would spew gas in. I had a pillow to put the, put the fire on. And that's what I drove her in on the first day. Why is that guy going to approve me? As These are all horrible things, and we're laughing. Right? <laughs> yeah, this, is what, this is my pain for your joy. And that's what I, that's what I, you know, we're martyrs to our thing. I really put every experience, and my father, he is a professionally paranoid employee of the defense industry and taught me this when I was hunting um, when I was a little kid and is 
you know, is suspicious of everybody and is always wrong. And that he's always wrong about everything he's suspicious of, every paranoid theory. And that's De Niro. De Niro's never right. I just I noticed he picked that lock. I go, oh, he does do one thing right. He doesn't he's wrong about every single suspicion he has in the entire movie, and he's supposed to be a mole hunter for the CIA. That's my dad. So um, so I have these control